will continue to be a top priority for the United States as we work to obtain their release. The Biden-Harris administration is committing to bringing home every unjustly detained American overseas, and we have a tra track record of doing so, as you all saw just last week. Over the past three and a half years, we have brought home over 50, uh, I'm sorry, 50 Americans who have been uh, unjustly detained, and our efforts will continue, will continue until all of those uh, who have been detained are reunited with their families. With that, Sean? Uh, sure, let's, unless anybody wants to, to follow up on that. Uh, I do, go ahead. actually, if you yeah. don't mind. No, please, Just please. directly on, on, on your topper. So first, every engagement you've had with the Taliban, can you say how many engagements there have been with the Taliban? Since? No, I'd have to take that back and get, we have, um, uh, as you know, from time to time, engaged with them at international fora, and in every one of those engagements we raise, among other issues, the need for them to release the Americans that they are unjustly detaining. Okay, the frequency of those interactions, I think, would be of interest to these Yeah, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to take it back and get it um, to you. And, and on Ryan Corbett in particular, I mean, Ryan's wife, Anna, has spoken publicly in recent days about how difficult it has been for families to learn of possibly disparate levels of attention, um, painstaking diplomacy, I think, were her words, uh, to detainees whose profiles may not have reached uh, the level of attention that, for example, the detainees who were being held in Russia um, had. So is it fair to say that these cases in Afghanistan have gotten less attention, fewer resources by comparison? Uh, absolutely not. So let me say two things about that. Number one, we don't determine the level of attention that cases get from the press. Um, I think you know that the media covers some cases more prominently than others. Um, but we control the level of attention that we commit on behalf of the United States government. And I can tell you that we um, are absolutely committed to bringing home Ryan Corbett and the other detainees uh, wrongfully detained in Afghanistan, as well as detainees uh, wrongfully uh, held all around the world. And the secretary has spoken to Ryan Corbett's wife. I know she was here just this week and met with Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, met with uh, uh, Roger Carstens, the special, the mm -hmm. SPIHA. Um, we engage with the family all the time and um, continue to work through our diplomatic efforts to try, try and bring them home. That said, I, I, I've said this before, it's impossible for me to imagine what these family members must be going through. And I, I assume that it is particularly painful every time they see other detainees brought home um, because they can only help, they can't help but think about their loved ones who we weren't able to get out at that time. So I would just point to the track record that we have had over the past three and a half years. And when we say we're not forgetting anyone, we mean it. And we have the record to back that up. And we will continue to use every resource the United States government has to try and bring Ryan and other wrongfully detained Americans home. I recognize it's a different spokesperson in a different building, but Anna in particular has been pained by the fact that she hasn't been able to secure a second meeting with Jake Sullivan, despite a promise he apparently made to meet with her before the State of the Union if Ryan wasn't free by then, nor has she been able to meet with President Biden. I don't know if you're in a position to say whether state steps in in those instances I or... So I, I, I certainly can't speak for the schedules of principals uh, not in the State Department, but I knew that Jake Sullivan has met with her before. And as I said, we um, uh, just held a number of meetings with her this week, and we'll continue to meet with her. We'll continue to engage with her. The Secretary has talked with her. I know that uh, our colleagues in the White House will continue to engage with her as well as when it comes to specific schedules. Of course, I can't speak to that from here. Thank you. Sorry. Sure. Uh, just can I follow up? Sure. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Sure. Just to stay on that subject. Just, just to understand, you're using the term unjustly detained. Uh, I think when you're referring to the three, but is there wrongfully de wrongfully detained determinations on? Uh, there one? are wrongful. We um, uh, have made determinations that Ryan Corbett and George Glessman are wrongfully detained. That's not a determination we have yet made um, uh, with respect to Mahmoud Habibi, um, which is not to say we're not working to try and secure his release. We are working to try and secure his release. Oftentimes, we can't make a wrongful determination, a wrongful uh, uh, wrongful detention determination because um, we don't have access to certain types of information or because the situation is unclear. Um, there can be other factors as well, but I can tell you we are working uh, uh, over time to try to get his release as well. What's the difference when you say someone is unjustly detained and say they're wrongfully So they're wrongful wrongful, wrongfully detained is a legal determination under the factors of the Levinson Act. There are other people who we believe are unjustly detained. Uh, Mahmoud Habibi is one of them. 
But for whatever reason, we have not been able to apply the factors of the Levinson Act, either because they just they don't meet that criteria in that case, or we don't have sufficient information to make that determination. But we still have information to believe that um, it's an American citizen that ought to be released, and we try to get them released. And that's what we're doing with Mahmoud Habibi. Uh, sure, let's go to the Middle East. Sure. Um, lots to discuss, but could I actually start with um, Norway, uh, Israel and Norway. Uh, the Israelis have, um, uh, have have revoked the, the diplomatic status of a number of Norwegian diplomats accredited for the Palestinian Authority. This obviously after Norway, uh, along with, uh, with, with Ireland and Spain, recognized uh, a state of Palestine. Uh, the U.S. has good relations with Israel and Norway. Do you have any comment on this? We have good uh, relations with both of them, as you point out. I, I think I would just say that Norway has a long history of playing a productive role when it comes to uh, engaging with the government of Israel and engaging with the Palestinian Authority, um, engaging with the Palestinian people. If you look at their role in uh, helping mediate the Oslo Accords, if you look at their role just this year in helping facilitate the release of tax revenue to the, the Palestinian Authority, they have long played an important role, and we think it's important that they continue to be able to play that role in talking both with the PA and with Israel. We don't think steps to um, uh, to uh, prevent them from playing that role are particularly helpful, and we'll continue to engage with both countries. Uh, have, has the United States engaged specifically with Israel in this? So that uh, I'm not aware of any specific conversations. We may have had them in the embassy. I'm just not aware of any. Um, to put it a bit more directly, would the United States hope that Israel takes back this stuff. So I'm not going to speak to that. We always believe that diplomatic engagements are important, diplomatic relationships are important, and we have seen that diplomatic relationships between Norway and Israel um, uh, have been important, and that it's been important that Norway be able to communicate with Israel and the Palestinian Authority, and we think that the productive role they can continue to play, and we would hope that they would be able to do so. Um, sure. Go ahead, go ahead. Is that, yeah. That this is going to lead to a, a, a dissolution of this agreement that you have about I don't the have Palestinian any, taxpayers? I don't have any specific concern about that at this point. Obviously, it's something that we'll um, monitor over the days to, uh, to come. Uh, we have seen tax revenue continue to be transferred. I believe some was just transferred uh, either today or in the last few days, and it's important that that revenue continue to be transferred. It is, as we've said a number of times, ultimately money to which the PA is entitled. Um, uh, so it's something we'll continue to monitor. Um, so go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to go through the front, but I've already come to you, so I should go I know, to the side. I'm but sorry. Go well, ahead. Middle East specific. Go I'm ahead. Happy to wait go ahead. No, it's go ahead. Okay, so you can come to go me. ahead. Um, one, does the U.S. have any indications from its diplomatic conversations that Iran is rethinking any part of the need to retaliate for the strike uh, so, on Hania? So two things to that. One, I'm not going to speak to our private diplomatic conversations. I'm certainly not going to speak to what Iran may or may not be planning, um, other than to say, as we've said for several days now, and it's been the, the uh, focus of our diplomatic engagements, is we continue to make clear to Iran that they should not escalate this conflict, they should not take uh, any further escalatory steps, that those steps are not in their interest, they're not in the interests uh, of a, uh, the wider region. And that's a, uh, that is a point we will continue to uh, impress uh, in all of our diplomatic engagements in the region. You've also stressed the need or the uh, the help that uh, a ceasefire deal would um, provide in, in lowering tensions. Is it clear to the U.S. how persuasive the prospect of a ceasefire deal is to the Iranians? Do they is the appeal of a deal greater than the need to retaliate? So. Again, I don't want to speak for the, Irani or the Iranians or try to make an assessment about what is convincing to the Iranians or what is compelling to them or what's going to go into their mind when they make their decisions. I will say that there are two sides of this coin. On one side of the coin, yes, we believe that a ceasefire would go a long way towards alleviating tensions in the region. It would obviously um, uh, have immediate benefits for the Palestinian people in Gaza. It would have immediate benefits for the hostages and their families. Um, but we think it would um, allow us to um, uh, make progress in the diplomatic endeavors we have been pursuing to bring calm along the Israel-Lebanon border. And it would allow us to ease broader regional tensions. On the other side of that coin, Certainly any further escalation 
just makes all of the region's problems more difficult. And one of the problems that we're addressing is the conflict in Gaza and trying to reach a ceasefire. So it is true that um, anytime you have an increase in tensions, it makes all of our diplomatics, diplomatic efforts more difficult. So I would hope that that's something that Iran is paying attention to and something that they're cognizant of and they wouldn't want to do anything to, to hurt prospects for a ceasefire. They wouldn't want to do anything to further raise regional tensions uh, and risk the uh, or raise the risk of this conflict spiraling out of control, but we can't speak for them. You spoke yesterday about um, the need for an in-person negotiator to be designated by Hamas before ceasefire talks could be taken over the finish line. Until that person is designated or steps forward or is named, is the U.S. trying to sort of get the Israel's side of the deal to a final place so that once there is a de designation, all it takes is a signature? So it's hard to say getting one side to the deal to a final place when it obviously is a negotiation and you can't get agreement from one party without the other. Um, let me say two things about it, though. Yes, we have been in contact with Israel about trying to get a deal finalized, and um, we have been in contact with the other two mediators, Egypt and Qatar, about um, uh, how we would get, you know, potential ways to get a, a deal finalized and how we might bridge the differences between the two parties. And the second thing I'll say is we continue to emphasize to the government of Israel, as we believe uh, Egypt and Qatar are emphasizing to Hamas, that the onus is on them to agree to a ceasefire, that we have uh, made great headway, but we need to finalize the agreement. We need to finalize it as soon as possible. I have one more in Vienna, but we'll defer. Oh, wait, Saeed, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, actually, in response to uh, Olivia on the deal, you know, uh, the, the Israeli press uh, yelled out uh, our note, and uh, uh, the Times of Israel both reported that the United States is willing to let Israel start whatever military operations after phase one of a ceasefire. Can you confirm that? Can no, confirm I can't. NL? I don't know to what that's referring. Obviously, we've spoken to the framework of a deal a number of times, and the framework of the deal is that there is a six-week ceasefire that would be agreed right. to um, once the deal is finalized. And uh, before that six-week ceasefire ends, we would enter into further negotiations to try to extend it and try to get into to, uh, phase two of the agreement. And so... What we have made clear we want to see happen is for that ceasefire to be extended and ultimately um, provide an end to the war and beyond that provide broader uh, peace and stability. But of course there is a negotiation process at the end of stage one that has always been clear. We've been, I think, quite open about that. Now these reports claim that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu insists on having something in writing from you that he said that he can attack at will, basically. You know, that this is a condition that he will not budge from. You so have any comment so on that? again, I don't know what those reports are referring to, but Said, if you look at the very well described, if you look at the very well described um, architecture of the agreement, there is a negotiation process at the end of phase one that you have to go through and you have to reach to get to phase two. And I think that's been, been quite clear and it will require, as has been true for, um, for getting to, to get, you know, just, just reaching where, getting to where we have before. Of course, that'll be a negotiation and uh, Israel will wanna make sure that its interests are protected in that negotiation. Um, but we have been very clear that we want to see this um, ultimately lead to an end of the war. By all accounts, you know, the negotiation right now are now moving or frozen or whatever on hold, uh, but Hamas said that or Sanwar said that they, you know, they 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 want to go ahead with the ceasefire talks. Does that change in any way the pace of what's going on? Uh, so I am not going to get into um, an underlying discussion about the negotiations themselves, other than to say that um, uh, certainly we want to see them finalized. And finally, I wanted to ask you about the uh, you know the administration is being sued by. Uh, Israeli settlers whom you have imposed sanctions on. Uh, I mean, how, how do you handle a situation like this? And uh, especially, I mean, this morning, Mr. Netanyahu told the, the settlers that he is going to do everything possible to reverse those sanctions. He will, that, in fact, you know, he promised them that he will do that. So on our underlying, on our underlying policy, we've been quite clear um, uh, about that policy and the reason for it. But when it comes to the litigation itself, I have to, of course, defer to the Department of Justice right. to speak that to it. It's not going to, let's say, to sway the decision one way or the other, the fact that there may be some legal ramifications so I'm not, for so, this. 
Let's be clear. I'm not in any way going to comment on litigation because, uh, as okay, I said I'll, before, I'll, when I was at the Justice Department, I didn't like it when people at the State Department podium commented on it. So I'm going to try to um, uh, respect that equity. That said, we have been quite clear that we expect Israel to take actions to crack down on settler violence. And if they don't, we will. We have taken those steps, and we will continue to do so as appropriate. Yeah, just to clarify, I'm asking policy question, not that. Yeah, yeah well, I, I was, that's why. Question? Hold on. That's you why. Yeah. That's why I answered on the policy grounds yeah. without speaking to the, the, the legal case. Thank you. Could I just follow up yeah. briefly just one more on the OIC? Um, uh, so the OIC. <laughs> I was going to say, what? <laughs> I was going to say, if I didn't know, I wasn't aware we'd gotten a question about yeah, that yet. Exactly. Uh, although there was an issue with China and the U.S. and the Olympics. Anyways, uh, but I was, I was just going to ask the, um, the statement from um, the Organization of, of Islamic Cooperation on, uh, on the killing of Hani. It, it, does the United, States have, the United States have a take on that? They're basically criticizing the, the killing, saying that it wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't supportive of the region. <coughs> Do you have any, any read about what, what came out of the meeting, whether it is at all helpful for, for the U.S. goals and de uh, So I don't want to speak to the meeting in specific other than to say, look, a as we have made clear, we were not involved in his death. We were not aware of his death before it happened. And our focus now is going to continue to be to try to convince all parties in the in the region from taking further steps to escalate the conflict. And it's certainly our hope that at that meeting yesterday, uh, our partners in the region did make clear to, to Iran what we know they believe and what they've told us they believe, which is further escalation only uh, damages the region and, and raises the risk of the conflict spiraling out of control. Yeah. Come back to the... Um Actually, just to follow up on Saeed's question, so so if, if the Dep State Department is sued, you wouldn't you won't comment. The you when the State Department is sued, the same way any agency of the federal government is sued, sued, they are represented in court by the Justice Department, and we defer to the Justice Department to speak to matters of litigation. I will still speak to the policy questions, which I did, but when it comes to litigation itself, I I have to defer yeah, to the Justice Department. No, it's, a, it's a it's a lawsuit against this department, but yeah. That and, makes I, sense. and I'm gonna let my let our let our attorneys speak for us, okay, uh, sure. which is always good advice. And. Um, just to follow up on, on well, on, the, on the, the, the hostage talks, ceasefire talks, there's some reporting from the national in the region that um, you know, Yahya Simwa, after being appointed as the, the new head of Hamas, uh, has sent a message through the Egyptian mediators of his kind of position uh, on the on the talks, you know, saying he's got a, uh, he, his firm position is that there should be a full Israeli withdrawal from Gaza. He wants the release of high prof profile detainees um he's against the deployment of a multinational force so these are you know these are things that that i think the u.s some of those things the u.s has been in support of it seems to suggest that uh he's going to have a stronger or you know potentially the, the there could be an even even more difficult approach by hamas to the negotiations um have you been sort of informed by the egyptians of a message coming from sinwa to the negotiating team there uh about any new position or new, uh, you know, new approach. Look, I'm uh, not going to negotiate in public at all. Um, but I will say, one thing that was true before the death of Hania and remains true today is that Sinwar was ultimately the decider when it comes to questions on these talks. And so, whether he is sending messages directly or sending messages through intermediaries, he has always been the person who would decide whether Hamas agreed to a ceasefire or not, and under what conditions they would agree to a ceasefire. So uh, we don't believe that that has changed. Yeah. Vienna. Yeah. Oh, oh. Another yeah, go ahead. Um, so on the uh, boiling of an apparent ISIS terror plot targeting a Taylor Swift concert in Vienna, did the State Department have visibility in advance of that plot so it might I, happen? So I will say that we are in touch with the Austri uh, Austrian government about this. They have said it's an ongoing investigation, so I will leave it to them to speak to the details of that investigation. Um, obviously, the safety and security of Americans overseas is our number one priority. Um, we have been in contact with the Austrian government about this matter. As a general case, we do uh, share information with our allies and partners about terrorism activities, just as they share uh, information with us. Um, that's not to speak to this specific case, but just as a general practice that we we always try to work with um, our allies and partners about information that we may have that's of concern or that they may have that's concerned to us and we'll continue to do that. It's well and publicly reported that the plot was disrupted on the basis of U.S. intelligence that was conveyed to the Austrian authorities. So I'm just curious whether the department was also apprised of that kind of intelligence 
given so many U.S. citizens might have been put at risk? So I certainly wouldn't want to speak to or confirm any kind of intelligence information. We have been, and when I say we, the broader United States government has been in touch with the Austrian government. The State Department has been in touch uh, with the Austrian government. And I think it's important um, uh, to say one other thing about this, which is we do uh, commend the very swift action that they took to uh, disrupt what could have uh, quite obviously been a very serious incident. Um, ahead of the tragic attacks at Crocus Hall in Russia, the State Department did issue a security alert uh, to U.S. citizens to avoid large gatherings for 48 hours. I guess it's contingent on the question you haven't answered, which is whether you knew that this was a possibility why an advisory, a similar advisory, wouldn't have been made in this case? So obviously I can't, I, I can't really speak to that um, without getting into the underlying details, which um, I, I very much can't do. I will say that we take very seriously our duty to warn American citizens about threats to their safety and security uh, overseas. Um, and when we have action, when we have um, information that we need to get in their hands. We get it in their hands as soon as possible. Um, there are times when um, intervening events take place that make it unnecessary to send that type of information uh, publicly, but when we need to, we very much do. Okay, and are there any specific resources at this stage being offered to Americans who are still in Vienna, who are concerned they might be at risk? Is the department coordinating any term, any resources, offering any messaging to, uh, again? So we would encourage all um, uh, all travelers to Austria, just as is true that we encourage all travelers anywhere to, uh, in the world to enroll in our STEP program. So if we, um, uh, if we do have relevant information to them and their, uh, their particular safety situation, they get it as soon as possible, and we would, uh, that we would encourage travelers to Austria to do that. But that said, I want to be very clear, Austria remains a level one country. Um, uh, uh, it is a, a country that we deem to be safe to travel to. Obviously, there are risks in traveling there, just as there are risks in traveling around America. There are risks uh, in, in being anywhere. Um, but it is a country that's safe to travel to. We work closely with Austrian law enforcement authorities, and, and they did an incredible job in disrupting this plot, and I think that ought to be remembered. So. Tangentially related to Russia, um, next week we're coming up on the anniversary. You never know where this is going to go. Whenever I hear tangent, I'm always wondering how, well, how, big, how big the tangent's going to be, because I've got, not, not you, I've gotten some big ones. <laughs> I don't think it's too far of a stretch, but you can disagree with me. Um, we're coming up next week on the anniversary of Austin Tice's being taken uh, yeah. in Syria, wondering if the prisoner swap last week with Russia created any, I don't know, movement or potential movement um, on his case. I don't want, you know, I never want to speak to the details of underlying cases um, from the podium just because they're all incredibly sensitive. Um, and we work to bring detainees home. We are very, uh, have been working for years, of course, to try to uh, bring Austin Tice home. Um, but no, I can't speak to any underlying details. Um, this might not be on the top of your radar, if you don't mind asking a quick question on this. There yeah. are these two um, college students from Texas who were in Mexico last week on Thursday. Um, they're both safely back in the U.S. now, but their doctors treating them in Dallas think that they were poisoned by synthetic fentanyl while in Mexico at a hotel where they were staying. I did manage to get a, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, just tell me. But I, I did manage to get a statement from you guys telling us that at least states aware and of I, the case. I was just wondering, um, so they're back here in the U.S. receiving treatment. I know the embassy helped them sort of escape this Mexican hospital that was trying to extort them. Um, do you have any updates on that or any yeah. cautionary words yeah. for Americans traveling to Cancun or cautionary words on, you know, synthetic fentanyl? Since so, look, I, I, I do apologize. I've seen limited information about the case, but I'm, I'm uh, a little reluctant to speak about it for fear of misspeaking. I'll take it back and see if we can get you uh, any more information. But uh, with respect to Mexico, look, the same thing applies to Mexico as it applies to every country in the world, which is we ask travelers before they travel anywhere to um, uh, check the State Department website and look at the travel uh, advisories for where they're uh, intending to travel, which can be both broad and sometimes are specific to specific regions of the country uh, and then of course yes to um, to enroll in our our step program so they get uh, real-time information when there are relevant updates that we can push out to them and then of course with the, the risk of fentanyl um, is something that is um, uh, a long stand or a broad 
risk to Americans here. It's a risk to Americans when they're traveling overseas and something that we continue to spend great resources trying to, to fight. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Michelle. Matt, uh, you, you said that uh, the U.S. sent a direct message to uh, Iran to de-escalate. Uh, uh, is the U.S. in talks with Hezbollah to de-escalate too, or uh, you're relying on Iran to control uh, Hezbollah? So we don't communicate directly with, with Hezbollah, but we have um, uh, sent messages to everyone in the region. Of course, there are partners in the region that do talk to Hezbollah that we talk to. And we have encouraged in all of our diplomatic engagements with our partners in the region for them to do anything they can to try and bring down tensions. And that includes sending de-escalatory messages to anyone who might be think of thinking of escalating this conflict. Michelle. Yeah, I'd like to take you to West Africa. Um, mm -hmm. Niger has broken relations with Ukraine. I wonder what you um, think of that and whether you think there's kind of a, a trend of countries in that region turning more toward Russia. So obviously we have seen um, Russian involvement in various countries in that region. When it comes to um, relationships with uh, Ukraine, sometimes I spoke to with respect to earlier in the, in, in the briefing, um, you know, not with respect to Ukraine, but in general, we always believe that diplomatic relations are important and it's good for countries to talk to each other and have the, the ability to um, resolve disputes and resolve issues that they have and that's why diplomacy is important so we would encourage those countries to uh, continue to talk with each other but when it comes to Russia's presence in Africa certainly we have seen a destabilizing presence by Russia we've seen a destabilizing presence by the Wagner group over the last couple of years and what we have noted is that every time Wagner comes in, every time Russia comes in to um, West Africa, as is true around the world, we see them sow chaos and instability in their wake. Russia's uh, foreign ministry spokesperson, though, accuses Ukraine of opening a new front against Russia in Africa, and I wonder how you respond to that. I just don't have any assessment on that. Can I follow up on that? Yeah, go ahead. Angola, under the leadership of President Juan Lorenzo, just fully uh, mediate the ceasefire between the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda. And yesterday, Secretary Blinken praised President Lorenzo for his leadership role on that mediation. And he also expressed the U.S. support to Angola. So can you give us more insights on the U.S. view on the Angolan government uh, mediation work to achieve this sure. ceasefire? So Secretary Blinken had a, a chance to speak directly to President Lorenzo yesterday to thank him for the role that Angola played in helping uh, mediate this conflict and reach a ceasefire in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, this was a follow-up to previous conversations the Secretary had, had with President Lorenzo. He traveled to Angola in January and met with the President and talked with him about the important role that Angola was playing in trying to mediate this conflict and thanked him again, uh, thanked him then for the work that they uh, uh, were doing encouraged Angola to continue to play that work and so when he called him yesterday um, part of the, the part of the purpose of that call was to thank the president for his engagement which has borne fruit and can and encourage him to continue to stay engaged and uh, how the United States intend to continue to work with Angola so that ceasefire can reach its full potential, which is to bring peace in that region. So we're going to continue to consult with the president and other uh, leaders in the Angolan government. Um, it, it is, as, as I said, something we know the president has spent a good deal of personal time uh, working on, trying to get this ceasefire over the line. Um, and uh, we will con encourage them to continue to stay engaged to see that the ceasefire holds. But is there any uh, uh, U.S. strategy to help so this ceasefire can last? So ultimately, it's the parties that need to commit to uh, uh, ensuring that the ceasefire lasts. And we will continue to engage with our partners in the region to impress upon the parties um, that it is in the interest of everyone in the re uh, region that the ceasefire hold and turn into, of course, uh, a permanent end to the war. Alex. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Ukraine, and moving to Ukraine operation. Um, obviously, Kiev officials are tight-lipped, given the nature of the operation. But we want to get your assessment on the latest, and also perhaps a, a reaction to how Russian propaganda machine yesterday tried to twist portion of the U.S. government's statement 
particular event, the White House said that you guys are seeking information from Kiev. Does Ukraine have your full backing in this? Uh, so when it comes to the your reference to the Ukrainian government being tight-lipped about their operation, I think you can certainly understand that if the Ukrainian government isn't speaking to it, I'm not going to speak to an operation that they're conducting. Obviously, we strongly support Ukraine's uh, uh, effort to defend against Russia's ing- aggression. Um, that continues to be the case. Nothing has changed from the comments I made yesterday. Ukrainian intelligence suggests that uh, Russia is, has been using a Kursk nuclear power plant to um, basically uh, keep Iranian drones and missiles there. Does it uh, raise your concern? So um, I'm not going to speak to Ukrainian intelligence, but certainly we have seen um, Russia launching attacks from the region just across the border where Ukraine is currently operating. A couple more on Russia, please. Uh, YouTube, uh, they try to um, make it, it slow down YouTube in Russia, but in some portion of Russia, uh, it's completely, you know, uh, uh, blocked. Do you have any reaction to how they restrict uh, this means to, you know, millions of Russians? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's something that we've seen Russia uh, undertake for some time and undertake in an accelerated fashion since the uh, full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February of uh, uh, 2022. And... What they have done is try and consistently crack down on the ability of Russian citizens to access information about what their government is doing. So we continue to continue to condemn these crackdowns. We continue to urge the Kremlin to stop blocking access to information uh, for its own people. And as we've said before, it's not exactly a sign of confidence in the legitimacy of your operations when you're cracking down on your own citizenry's ability to access information about those operations. Thank you. And one more Zaharova comment, if you don't mind, uh, my colleague asked about. Um, she today also spoke about your policy on South Caucasus. I'm going to quote her, not to dignify what she says, but the quote says that the U.S. is promoting a destructive uh, agenda in the South Caucasus with the main goal of dividing the region and destroying Russia's historical ties with its neighbors. Is that your policy? Is that a good So I, when you referred to it uh, as my, referred to that quote as coming from my colleague, I s- thought you were starting with someone from the State Department, and now I hear it. I think Absolutely. very much, I think, I think very much you were not. <laughs> Uh, Again, so we often hear these quotes uh, from the Russian government. I wonder who they're talking about, because the quotes that you hear from them describe Russia's own destabilizing activities uh, in the region. It is, and I would remind the entire world that it is Russia um, that has invaded its neighbors, that it has occupied uh, its neighbor's territory and continues to conduct war against its neighbors. Time. Up on the, on the Kursk region offensive. Can you give us an example of a of a Russian attack that was launched specifically from this area that the Ukrainians have? have gone no, I, into? I am not going to speak to those from here. But speaking to that region, we have seen um, uh, Russia launch attacks from from from, from the region like from the border town that the Ukrainians. Have I'm not going to get. Speci- I'm not going to. It's just something we do in the state where we never speak to like specific strikes. Not. Sp- I'm not going to speak to any specific town or specific area. But in the region where Ukraine is operating, yes, we have seen Russia right. launch attacks from there. And you you say, you know, the policy hasn't changed earlier when the policy was initially announced. I think, you know, I think a lot of people to a lot of people, it sounded a lot more limited. uh, And it's been it's described by the Pentagon as this is about the ability to fire back when fired upon. In this case, you know, whether it's whether it's right or wrong, uh, Russia has obviously invaded Ukraine and, and crossed its borders. But the policy was that U.S. weapons uh, initially weren't being u- weren't to be used across the border. That policy was relaxed with, with the caveat that you know this is for firing back when fired upon. Has Ukraine been fired upon from this area that's, that's the, sort of caused them to launch this the, offensive? So I will not speak to why they launched the offensive. That is for the Ukrainian uh, government to speak to when it comes to their decision making around this offensive. Um, but the policy that we announced was to allow Ukraine to respond to attacks coming just o- from just over the Russian border. And yes, uh, in the area where they are currently operating across the Russian border, we have seen attacks come from there. Good. Back to the Middle East, uh, yeah. Matt. Uh, Wall Street Journal is just reporting that the U.S. has warned Iran that its government and economy would suffer a devastating blow in case it retaliates against Israel. I was wondering if this is uh, necessary, if it's necessary to go that far to hurt the economy, which typically and naturally affects the people, to deter Iran. So I am not going to speak to messages real or imagined that might have been delivered to the Iranian government. We have always said that um, we have the ability to deliver messages when it's in our interest, but we typically don't speak to those messages in public. And oftentimes you see messages um, 
described that are not described entirely accurately. That said, of course, escalation of the conflict has the ability to hurt Iran's economy. It has the ability to hurt the economy of every country in the region. Um, war obviously has the, the um, potential impact of hurting economies. And so what's something I said yesterday is that every problem that the region currently faces is made worse by further escalation. And that certainly includes economic impacts. Can I ask a about the Austin Tice. Yeah. Oh. I mean, it, uh, we're coming up on the 12th anniversary of his disappearance. And I remember asking the very same question probably right when he disappeared back then. So, why are you not uh, willing to speak with the Syrian government on this? I mean, it's a country that you still recognize. You have not, and and uh, they claim they don't know anything about it. But so, I assume that if you probably work with them, they probably so could find out what so, happened. Said, I will say that we are taking every step that we believe is productive to try and secure his return. We don't speak to all those steps publicly. Don't speak to most steps of those uh, most of those steps publicly. But everything that we believe can be productive uh, in um, securing the release of any wrongfully detained American, we try to take. Yeah. Uh, a couple in Asia. Uh, could we go to Bangladesh? Uh, mm-hmm. Mohammed Yunus was sworn in today as the, the interim leader of Bangladesh. Can you say, first of all, if there's been any communication with him directly or indirectly? Uh, there has been communication uh, with the interim government, and uh, our charge d'affaires attended um, uh, his swearing in today. I don't know if she spoke to him at the swearing in, but she did attend. Okay, communication with the interim government, not necessarily him personally, but with correct. Oprah. And what Correct. Was the I mean, he was only sworn into the government, I think, an hour ago, so <laughs> an hour or two ago. It wasn't the nature of the communication. I'm not asking for specifics, but was it in terms of the, the path forward in Bangladesh? Was it about U.S. interests? What's so I'm not going to speak to the private diplomatic conversations, but obviously one of the things that we have made clear is that we um, want to see the interim government chart a democratic future for the people of Bangladesh. Uh, unless somebody wants to follow up on that, should I? Uh, a couple other. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Uh, Japan, this is back on the Middle East, but uh, Nagasaki, of course, uh, today's the eighth. It's the anniversary tomorrow of the, the atomic bombing in, um, in Nagasaki. Uh, ambassador Emmanuel, as well as the British ambassador, and I think the, the European ambassadors are not going to attend because the Israeli ambassador wasn't invited. Uh, the Nagasaki mayor says this is. Logistical. Uh, why is it so important that the Israeli uh, ambassador be present? You know, Look, we thought it was important that um, the Israeli ambassador be invited, as the ambassadors of other countries have been invited. That no country that uh, should have been singled out to not be invited to this celebration, and that's why the ambassador took the step that he did. And I, I presume why the ambassadors of other countries took the steps that they did in deciding not to attend. But in terms of. Um to play devil's advocate, in terms of historic responsibility, obviously the U.S. dropped the bomb in Nagasaki. Was was it particularly significant for the U.S. to be there? I realize he was there at the Hiroshima. Look, uh, we, he was there, and uh, obviously um, uh, multiple different presidents of the United States have spoken to this, have attended events uh, commemorating um, uh, that solemn event, and I think our position on it and, and uh, our respect for Japan uh, when it comes to this anniversary is uh, well documented uh, and goes beyond, far beyond uh, the ambassador not attending one event. Sure. Okay, just a, a different topic in, in Asia. Uh, you issued a statement, I meant to ask about it yesterday, you issued a statement on Thailand, the, the Move Forward Party being banned, and um, Mr. Pita, who's arguably the most popular politician in, in, in Thailand, being banned from uh, from from politics. Uh, I know you issued a statement, but in terms of the, the future relationship with Thailand, Thailand's always obviously had a its ups and downs with, with democracy, but how do you assess the relationship going forward? Would this have an impact on cooperation with Thailand? So I... I don't want to speculate about the impact. We do have a close relationship with them, and we are able to cooperate with them on a number of uh, areas that are in our interest and in our mutual interest, but we were concerned about that step. Uh, it was a step that hurts democracy, um, and we'll continue to make that concern clear, uh, both publicly and privately, to the government of Thailand. Michelle? Do you have any updates on the talks on Sudan and Switzerland? I don't. Obviously, um, as we've said, one of the parties, the RSF, has agreed to attend. The SAF has not yet agreed to attend. The Secretary spoke to General Burhan several days ago and impressed upon him the importance of attending those talks and the importance of reaching a ceasefire, as well as the importance of not hindering access to humanitarian assistance that the Sudanese people need. Uh, and we will continue to impress that there is, on all of the parties, that there is there can be no military victory to this war. Every day it goes on uh, is just further tragedy for the Sudanese people, and so we certainly hope that the SAF will decide to attend the talks in Geneva next week. Thank you. Um, go ahead. 
From Venezuela. Um, so yesterday was a call between the Secretary General and the Secretary of State about their readiness to assist mm -hmm. in the process. Um, can you give us a little more details on what that will, will look like in terms of uh, a possible assistance from the United States? Um, we understand the Secretary General will have to get a letter by Venezuela to, for his good offices, but how that engaged the region, and if you can talk uh, to them. You know, I can't speak to any, any detail beyond what we said in the readout other than to say that the Secretary engaged with the Secretary General in the same way that he's, we've been engaging partners with partners in the region about um, the fact that we are ready to support an inclusive Venezuela-led process to um, reestablish democratic uh, norms. And so we're going to continue to coordinate with our international partners about the best way to do that, understanding that it needs to be a Venezuelan-led uh, process. Um, just a follow-up. Um, so yesterday, um, the organization that protects journalists within Venezuela, their syndicate, um, alerted that uh, several journalists, photographers have been detained, um, and they're concerned about not only their persecution, but according to that, they're prevented from getting a private uh, counsel. So the government is the prosecutor at the same time is who is providing them their lawyers, and they're not allowed to get private counsel. Is that a concern that this is another tactic by the government of Maduro to try to intimidate on the freedom of the press and to reduce the access of journalists um, to even counsel and due process? So certainly we have been concerned about the government's crackdown on freedom of information, on freedom of press and freedom of assembly. Um, we've seen them taking increasingly repressive steps in the over a week now since the election. Um, and we uh, would uh, encourage them to reverse those steps. I think, as I said yesterday, it is not exactly a sign of confidence um, in uh, their belief in the nobility of their actions. And so we're going to continue to support the Venezuelan people in um, making sure that their votes are, are fairly counted. And the last question, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, the U.S. had um, conversations actually um, before the elections. It was a virtual uh, meeting. Qatar is mediating. Uh, the government of, uh, government of Venezuela has released some of the um, information that was actually talked in private. Um, is it a possibility to retake those uh, conversations that were uh, ongoing, or is that something that is being paused? Uh, so I don't want to speak to those conversations in general, other than that we are uh, uh, talking to partners in the region and, and some partners around the world about the best way to uh, establish democratic transition in Venezuela. Uh, let me do one more and then have to wrap for the day. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. As Sean asked, a good day for Bangladesh. Nobel laureate Professor Yunus just, just took his office as chief advisor uh, in Bangladesh government. So. Are you congratulating uh, from the State Department or President to the new government? Uh, so as I said, uh, our, our Charge of Affairs attended the um, swearing-in of the President today, and we welcome Dr. Yunus's calm for an end to the recent violence, and we stand ready to work with the, the interim government uh, and Dr. Yunus as it charts a democratic future for the people of Bangladesh. One more on I gotta, hurry up, because I, I really got to go One more on Sri Lanka. With the arrest of IMF technical advisor and one of our South Asia perspectives, uh, writer Asanga Abe Ganaskara in Sri Lanka, an uh, apparent attempt to silence and instill fear in journalists along with the recent gun violence in Colombo, and caretaker President Vikram Singh, a protection of the corrupt Rajapaksa family. Is the U.S. concerned about this? Uh, let me take that question and get back to you. All right. Thanks, everyone.